Hello, it's Paul Tilly, and welcome back again. Today, we're going to take a look at Unit 5. Unit 5 deals with public sector collective bargaining. In this unit, we're going to take a look at four or five key issues regarding the public sector. First, we're going to define exactly what's meant by the public sector. Second, we're going to outline a brief history of unionism within the public sector. We're going to take a look at the various statutes governing public sector employees and govern and government employees in terms of uh, collective bargaining. We're going to take a look at the designation of essential employees within the public service and what the rationale for that is. And we're going to look at the unique features of the public sector. That's a very important one. Public sector collective bargaining is different than normal private sector collective bargaining. And we're going to spend a lot of time differentiating between the two. So let's begin. The public sector includes all the employees who work for the Crown, the Queen, us, the taxpayers of any country, any province, or any municipality. When we think of it, the public sector includes federal government employees, provincial government employees, municipal government employees, but it also includes members of Crown Corporations, corporations that are owned and operated by government. So, for example, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is owned and operated by the Government of Canada. It's a federal Crown Corporation. Likewise, Newfoundland Labrador, Nalcor, Newfoundland Hydro, Nalcor is owned and operated by the provincial government. And the employees, as a result, are members of that thing we call the public sector. In Canada today, most public and sector employees are unionized. And when we think about the unions that represent them, unions such as Canadian Union of Public Employees, QP, is a big union. And the, uh, we also think about the National Union of Public and General Workers, NUPG, and in Newfoundland and Labrador, NAEP, the Newfoundland Association of Public Employees, certainly would be considered as big unions that represent government type employees. In order to get a sense of where public employees came from in their quest for unionization, we really need to look at this kind of timeline that I have here on this slide. If you look at the timeline, you'll see the union movement in Canada is really no more than 150 years old. It's about as old as Canada itself. If we think the Canadian labor movement really didn't exist prior to 1873. In 1873, the National Labor organized itself into something called the Canadian Labor Union. The problem was back in the late 1800s is that unions were not legal per se. They were not legitimate entities. 1886, we saw the Canadian Trades and Labor Congress. 1908, the Canadian Federation of Labor. 1940, Canadian Congress of Labor. All those organizations really predated the legitimacy of unions. They were groups of people who would come together to protect their rights. It wasn't until 1944. 1944, the federal government, the Privy Council, which is a fancy name for the executive of government, the Privy Council created a law in Parliament called PC1003. PC1003 was a very important piece of legislation because what it officially did was allowed for the creation of unions in Canada. It legitimized unions for the very first time. So this piece of legislation was absolutely critical to the growth of unionism in Canada, let alone unionism in the public service. Effectively, PC1003 established a process that allowed workers to certify and become unionized. And once the union was certified, that union became the collective bargaining agent for the workers, the sole bargaining agent. It also established a grievance procedure, and what the grievance procedure allowed to happen was that instead of every time a problem arose within the confines of the collective agreement, Instead of having to go on strike or, or create a protest, it, it gave a proper order procedure to resolve disputes. So a grievance process allows for orderly dispute resolution without work interruption. Now that was a key element. That was 1944, and you know, we had 20 more years between 44 and 1960, 4, 67, when the federal government finally came up with a, a rule 
called the Public Service Staff Relations Act. And this law was brought in place in Parliament in 1967 and it revolutionized the civil service because what it did is it allowed for the civil service to unionize. Prior to that, a lot of people, and a lot of people in government, rejected the idea of unions because in government, rejected the idea of unions within government because the fact of the matter was is governments are, governments are sovereign, what's called sovereign. In other words, they're duly elected to make decisions on behalf of voters, citizens. And if we allow a union to be created, it effectively takes away some of the power from the sovereignly elected officials. And it was argued that that's not right, that's not democratic. However, counter arguments said that you know, workers have rights too and that those rights need to be balanced out against the rights of the sovereign movement. So in 1967, after a bit of tussling in Parliament and the fact that the, the NDP in particular had some power, they forced the Liberal government in 1967, or they encouraged, probably is a better word, the Liberal government in 1967 to move forward with this piece of legislation that created the rights of government employees to finally, federal government employees, to finally unionize. This 1967 bit of work allowed for unionism within the federal government, but it didn't take long for the provinces to fall in line. So the other provinces across Canada soon created equivalent pieces of legislation in their provincial legislatures that allowed provincial government employees to become unionized. And by 1975, all the provincial governments in Canada were given the rights to unionize. So, you know, unionization in the public service is really not that old. We're talking of a process that's less than 50 years old. As I've already mentioned, public sector has a slightly different set of rules than the private sector. What we're going to look at now is what makes it different. What are some of the big differences that exist? So let's take a look at some of the key differences in the public sector and private sector. First and foremost, collective bargaining in the public sector does not work quite the same way as collective bargaining in the private sector. And the real difference lies in three major areas. First, the employers are different. Second, the employees and the unions are different. And third, the legislation is different. And we'll look at those as we go through the examples here. First, most public sector employers are not driven by the need for profit. If you think about government, government's major role is to provide services. The focus is on giving services and ensuring the services are of a certain quality. And these services are given to the public, who will effectively pay for those services through their taxes. The private sector, on the other hand, is focused on making profit. So how can we minimize our costs, maximize our revenues, in order to maximize profit? That's different. That's a major difference. In the public sector, when employees go on strike, it creates a situation that adversely affects the public. Government saves money when government employees go on strike, but the thing is, is that the services are not being delivered so the public gets quite upset. In the case of the private sector, when the private sector are on strike, or when employees in the private sector are on strike, it limits the ability of the private sector employer to actually make money and it hits him in the pocketbook more or less. And government is the opposite of that. Government actually saves money. So from a union's point of view, going on strike sometimes can be self-defeating because the fact of the matter is, is that you're negatively affecting the people who pay your bills and the people you serve the public. And in certain cases, certain jobs in the public sector are must-do jobs. For example, hospitals. You cannot take your hospital employees off to the picket line and say, well, the heck with everyone in the hospital. That is just not on. So unlike uh, a business that you could shut down and it will have, yes, adverse consequences on the employer, but it won't really affect anyone outside, government doesn't necessarily work that way. There are a lot of people who work for government who do critical roles that just cannot end. Another key thing is in the legislation. There is special legislation for public sector employees. Take, for example, teachers in Newfoundland and Labrador. They're covered under the NLTA Act. 
the public sector employees work for government are covered under the Public Sector Collective Bargaining Act. However, employees in the private sector tend to be covered under the Labor Standards Act or the Labor Relations Act or some combination of both. So different sets of legislation. Now that the thrust of the legislation is essentially the same, however, certain components of it are different. We also have, in terms of legislation, the degree of freedom of bargaining. There are certain restrictions on the amount of leeway that government has in order to do things. So, for example, um, uh, private sector employees tend to be able to bargain over a great number of issues, whereas certain things in terms of government, you know, pension plans, criteria for promotions, transfers, layoffs, these things are more uh, tightly reined in government. And uh, uh, wage freezes, legislative wage freezes often happen by government in, time, in bad times. These are non-negotiables, and as a result, there's not as much leeway in the, private, in the public sector to, to bargain as there is in the, pub, in the private sector. We also got, in terms of unions, we, we can look at the limits of who can represent you. In, in the public sector, um, there tend to be public sector unions. Uh, Nate in Newfoundland and Labrador, QP, the Canadian Union of Public Employees in the federal civil service. Um, these tend to be unions that are just focused on public sector employees. In the private sector, you have a great number of unions representing a great variety of employees. So again, more choice in the private sector for the union choice. Probably one of the greatest issues in terms of major differences between public and private is this amazing dual role that government finds itself in. Government is an employer in the case of public sector employees, but it's also a legislator. Government has the ability to change the rules through the game. And unlike in the private sector, private sector employees can't change the rules. They have no ability to change the rules. Those rules are set by government. So government has this uncanny ability to change the rules and do things that private sector employers just can't do. Management authority is another key issue that separates public and private sector employees. Management authority, authority in the private sector tends to be very direct. You know who your manager is, you know who, what decision level, uh, where those decisions are made, and the level of decision making that's available. In the public sector, where it tends to be more accountability to the public, management is spread, meaning that there is no one person who has authority, absolute authority. Authority tends to be spread across different levels, um, might even require legislative authority by the legislature in order to make changes. So um, public sector is not one person calling the shots. So as a result, decisions are more slow or more consider. We also think that public sector union members are to be female, professional, and white collar than what you'll find in the private sector. And this means that certain issues would appeal to those type of people more completely or more intrinsically than uh, private sector employees. So things like pay equity, uh, women's issues, family issues would certainly come to a higher degree of importance in the public sector than it is in the private sector. And it also means that these workers who work for government have an intrinsic job satisfaction over serving the, their clients, serving the people who, who represent them. So if they were to go on strike or do something like that, it kind of puts them in an awkward position that they probably don't want to be in. Scope of issues that can be bargained are also narrower in the public sector, and again, we've already kind of described that, where the, the freedom to bargain is not as great in the public sector as it is in the private sector because of the limitations of the laws and the focus on service. And probably the single most important difference between public and private sector lies in the difference for resolving disputes. Special dispute settlement procedures have been devised for public sector and it's because of the essential nature of many of the employees who provide the services within the public sector. So, unlike in the private sector, we tend to have uh, more ability for arbitration to make decisions and to make change than in the private sector. So let's take a look at some of these arbitration things. Well, first of all, we got conventional interest arbitration. This is 
the standard arbitration where um, the arbitrator fashions a contract within certain broad limits. Now that's very similar to the private sector, same basic thing, you get the arbitrator to come in when you can't reach a decision, and the arbitrator makes a decision and that decision is imposed on all parties. We also have something called final offer arbitration, and in this case the arbitrator chooses either the union's position or the management's position in a new contract. And some collective agreements out there in the, pi, in the public sector have a provision for final offer arbitration. And that's a win-lose type situation, so obviously people are not too keen on that type of arbitration. We also have a choice of procedures. Unions are given the right to choose between bonding arbitration or a traditional conciliation strike type situation. And again, um, it's usually either or as opposed to both. And probably one that we see most evidence is controlled strikes. In other words, yes, we will allow you, the government says, we'll allow you to go on strike. However, we have to deem certain of your people as essential employees, and they have to report to work as usual. So the strike can go on, but in a limited capacity. So that's a quick review of the key differences between the private and public sector employees. I invite you to review all the material in that unit, take a look at the slides, take a look at the content, read the material in your textbook. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.